Four days after the outbreak of war, the citizens of Dover, England were awakened to the sight of a convoy of trucks rolling through the streets of their seaside town. Less warlike vehicles could hardly be imagined. Hastily requisitioned from the streets of London, they came emblazoned with advertisements for sauces, teas, biscuits, and other popular products of the day. In place of their usual cargoes, they carried a miscellany of canned food, water bottles, small stoves, tents, airplane struts, carburetors, spark plugs, piano wire, and tools of every description. This motley convoy represented the fledgling Royal Flying Corps' first preparations to go to war. On a large grassy plain on the outskirts of town, red flags were being planted along the ditches that bordered the field, even as the first airplanes began to arrive. The hastily erected airdrome would serve as a staging point for RFC squadrons 2, 3, 4, and 5, preparing to make the cross-channel hop to the continent. The aircraft that would eventually fly to France totaled 37 machines and were a mixed collection of Avros, French-built Henry Farmans and Moraine Parasols, and Royal Aircraft Factory BE-2s. While the Avros and Farmans were at best suited for training purposes, the BE-2 was England's most advanced flying machine at the time. Designed by Geoffrey de Havilland, the plane was both frail and heavy, but was nevertheless easy to fly and could carry a crew of two men at speeds up to 70 miles an hour. The first British squadron to land in France was RFC No. 2, which left the coast in their BE-2s at half past six on the morning of August 13 and touched down near Amiens nearly two hours later. Squadrons 3 and 4 also flew to France that day, with their contingent of ground personnel, equipment and supplies arriving on the continent later by trawler. Serving in number three squadron was mechanic first class James McCudden, a native of Kent who'd enlisted in the Royal Engineers back in 1910 to serve as a bugler. Following his older brother, he transferred into the Flying Corps in 1913, where he'd been trained as an aircraft mechanic at Farnborough. Number three squadron was equipped with Farmans and Marine parasols. The slow-moving Farman biplanes were an antique collection of struts and wires nicknamed the Flying Birdcage. The Farman's odd nickname derived from more than just its ungainly appearance. The plane's rigor would sometimes place a sparrow inside the massive wires holding the wings of the plane together, and if the bird managed to escape, it was evidence of a missing wire. When he caught up with the squadron at Amiens, McCudden found the aircrews busy attaching wooden racks along the sides of their parasols. The racks would be used to hold grenades for dropping on the enemy. Number three had also received some flechettes, steel darts designed by the French which were intended to rain down on the heads of the German troops. As McCudden observed, the odds against actually hitting someone with one of these darts was unlikely, and even the results would be, at best, dubious. Squadron number five ferried the Moraines and Farmans over to France on August 14th, but one of the pilots, Lieutenant Louis Strange, didn't make the trip until a day later because he'd been complaining of engine troubles. There was, in fact, nothing wrong with his motor. Strange had spent most of the night attaching a Lewis machine gun to the front cockpit of his Farman, and when he arrived in France the following day, his was the only armed airplane in the Royal Flying Corps. Three days after their arrival at the front, the pilots and observers of the Royal Flying Corps began their assigned tasks of reconnaissance. Operating at first from their base at Amiens, as well as an airfield near Mons in Belgium, they patrolled the entire area of the German advance and were able to provide some valuable information concerning the movements of the enemy. As the German drive progressed during those first weeks of war, the British air crews found themselves living a nomadic existence in constant retreat ahead of the advancing German army. Still, the catastrophic effect of the German invasion would have been far worsened if not for the information provided from the air during the opening days of the First World War. In Belgium, it had been a flying machine that had spotted the Germans' attempted flanking maneuver around Mons, and as a result, the British Army had staged an effective retreat that had both saved many British lives and halted the German thrust to the channel. Overnight, a new dimension had been added to the concept of 20th century warfare, and the reconnaissance value of this new tool had immediately proved itself indispensable. It did not take long for the German Air Force to make its presence known either. At the start of the war, the Flieger Troop was able to deploy a total of 180 aircraft along the Western Front, some 60% of which were Taube-type machines. Like their British counterparts, the German airmen concerned themselves primarily with observation duties. In most German aircraft of the day, it was typical that the pilot, often an enlisted man, acted as little more than the chauffeur for the officer-observer who commanded the plane. Unlike the British, however, the generals of the German army remained skeptical of reports filed by their pilots and observers. 
Schooled in an earlier time and distrustful of these machines to frighten horses, any advantages they might have gained from using these new contraptions went mostly unexploited in those first weeks of the conflict. Most people had assumed that this war would be fought in pretty much the same manner as the previous wars, with massed cavalry charges across open fields, and that the new weaponry being used would at best serve in minor supporting roles. Nothing could be further from the truth. As the French offensive to push the German army back from Paris began to lose momentum, troops on both sides started digging in, and the war began to settle down to the stalemate that would characterize the next four years.